For people unfamiliar with you, please tell us your name and what your background is and what you've been doing for the last decade. So my name is Theodora Scarato and I'm Executive Director with Environmental Health Trust. We are a nonprofit that is a scientific think tank and we work on educating people about preventable health risks. So we both educate the public as well as policymakers. Um, our scientists also publish peer-reviewed literature on environmental health issues. Our focus right now is on cell phones, wireless, and 5G. Um, what is 5G and how is it different from 2G, 3G, and 4G? That's a good question. So I too, when I first heard 5G, was like, what is that? It is the fifth generation technology. You might have heard about it because there have been a lot of full page ads in major newspapers um, by wireless companies about 5G connecting the Internet of Things. That is whereby not only will your phone connect to your dishwasher, connect to other phones um, and other machines in your house, but machines will be connecting with machines, self-driving cars, uh, virtual reality, where there'll be super fast speeds. This is what is being touted as 5G. But what people don't know is that the current wireless technologies that we're using now with our cell phone, uh, wireless and, and Wi-Fi, have substantial peer-reviewed published science showing adverse effects at levels that governments seem to say are safe, even though they don't actually say that, but they have limits. And, um, and li these limits aren't breached by what we're using now. However, with 5G, there's going to be more exposure to wireless radiation, and it's going to bring in new kinds of frequencies, higher frequencies that have never been used before uh, in a commercial way. And people are very concerned. Scientists are so concerned that they've issued appeals to the United Nations, to the World Health Organization, and they're calling for a moratorium on 5G because of the, the health impacts, and they're calling for proper safety testing before any new technology gets rolled out. If a phone is in airplane mode, is there any risk at all? Okay, so there are ways to reduce exposure to your phone, and one of the things that we talk about is using airplane mode. And I need to take, say two important things. First, for most phones, but not all, when you turn them on airplane mode, all the wireless antennas get turned off. But unfortunately, what we're finding out is that for some phones, especially the newer ones, they don't all get turned off or sometimes they hop back on, like maybe your Wi-Fi or if you click on Siri, even though you have airplane mode on, you turned your Wi-Fi off, or Bluetooth comes on. So our new recommendation with phones to reduce exposure is to turn it on airplane mode and make sure all of the antennas are off. And of course, to be contacting your elected representatives to make some changes so that cell phones um, well, two things. One is we need safe technology to be using safe technology, but also it shouldn't be that if someone has a phone that they can't turn all the antennas off with one swipe. There needs to be better hardware and software with, with our cell phones. Do cell phone antennas or Wi-Fi affect bees, insects, or other pollinators? Yes. Um, there is research that shows biochemical changes to bees, changes in their behavior. Uh, there's a recent study that was done on millimeter waves and submillimeter waves, which are the kind of the new frequencies we're going to be using w with 5G. And they found that insects actually absorb that radiation more into their bodies. And this. There was actually a study done by the several ministries in India, an inter, interministerial report. And because of that report about the potential impacts on birds and bees, because of course it disrupts the navigational system um, of, of birds, they have dropped their allowable limits, making them stricter uh, 
by one-tenth to one-tenth of what they were previously. That doesn't mean that they're at a safe level, but it's better than it was before. But this is a serious uh, concern of a lot of environmental scientists who are working on wildlife. So how'd you come up with one-tenth? Well, that's a good question. Well, how did it get there? The reality is there is no, a lot of the standard setting has been somewhat uh, arbitrary in that the scientists have identified way back when, 20, 30 years ago, when, um, and I shouldn't say scientists, I should say uh, groups who were made up of mostly industry and military decided, okay, the only problem that we are sure is happening with microwaves and wireless and, and this kind of radiation, radio frequency radiation, is heat. And then they, and heat, not all the other biological changes of which they actually knew that there were other effects that were happening, but they decided that they didn't necessarily know how that related to health. So then they dropped it and said, well, we have to protect people somewhat, let's, let's drop it. And they dropped it um, to where they say there's a 50 times safety factor, which actually Long story I'm not going to go into, but scientists say there is no 50 times safety factor. But let's say there was on heat. With other toxic agents, you would drop it maybe 100, 300 times. Where did the 50 come from? And what about kids? Their brains are still developing. How does this make any sense? And what you find when you peel back the onion, so to say, of the way these limits are set, they're not based on documentation that shows what these effects will be in the long term. That research was never done. It still hasn't been done. And uh, that is why some say that um, this is a crime against humanity.